Good morning, St. Andrew family, and welcome to our Sunday morning online worship service. I'm Justin Bullis, and it is my privilege to welcome you here today from the St. Andrew Sanctuary. I am grateful, as always, to share this sacred online space with you, where we are all invited, included, and valued as vital and beloved members of our broader worshiping community. St. Andrew is proud to be an open, affirming, inclusive congregation that welcomes all people into the full life and communion of our church. This includes saints and sinners, believers and skeptics, the lost and the found, the wanderers and the wanderers, families of all shapes and sizes, and people from every point along life's journey. No matter who you are or where you've been, no matter what you believe or even if you believe anything at all, you are welcome here and you belong here. Please take a moment to visit gostandrew.com slash sign in to let us know that you're here and to share some information about yourself. We'd love to know from where or from when you're joining us or if you have any prayer requests or questions about our church. If you would like to explore deeper engagement with the work God is doing in and through the St. Andrew community, you can email us directly at connect at gostandrew.com. We'd love to hear from you. Also, be sure to check out the announcement slides at the end of this video to see some upcoming events and opportunities to get more involved. You can also visit the events page on our website to see an updated events calendar. Lastly, if you would like to contribute a financial gift to the work and ministry of St. Andrew, you can visit gostandrew.com slash give or text St. Andrew to 28950. And now let's listen together as Reverend Mark brings us the final sermon in our stewardship series, Sowing the Seed. A reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 9, the New Revised Standard Updated Edition. For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not all too human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and each will receive wages according to their own labor. For we are God's co-workers working together. You are God's field, God's building. Here ends the word. If by some awesome superpower, you could somehow know the future, would it change how you live today? If you could peer far into the future and see how things turned out, how your own personal contribution made some difference in someone's life, maybe even in the world, would that impact the choices you make, the actions you take today? There's a clock currently being constructed deep inside a mountain in West Texas. It's 500 feet tall. It's engineered to require minimal maintenance. It's powered by mechanical energy harvested from sunlight. It's called the clock of the long now, but many call it the 10,000 year clock because once constructed, it will tick only once a year and chime only once a millennium as it marks time over the next 10,000 years. The clock is an art installation and public monument intended to inspire visitors to be mindful of their place in the long arc of history. It's the brainchild of American inventor and entrepreneur Danny Hillis, and it's meant to be a lesson in long-term thinking. In the same way the ancient pyramids are a symbol of the past, the clock of the long now is intended to be a symbol of the future, a reminder that we're connected to a future we cannot see from this side of history. Hillis says, I cannot imagine the world, but I care about it. He says, I'm a part of a story that starts long before I can remember 
and continues long beyond when anyone will remember me. I plant my acorns, he says, knowing that I'll never live to harvest the oaks. I have hope for the future. For most of us, it's hard enough to imagine what our life or the world might look like in 10 days or even 10 years, let alone 10,000 years from now. And of course, you could argue that if we don't change our habits of consuming and destroying Earth's resources, no one will even be around to tell time in 10,000 years. But still, how much of our lives is so consumed by the immediacy and urgency, the needs and desires of today, that we fail to look out at the horizon and imagine where all this is headed, where all this is going, what it all means. In Homer's epic tale, The Odyssey, there's that critical moment when Odysseus, on his long journey home, ties himself to the mast of his ship because he knows he won't be able to resist steering his ship toward the beautiful, alluring sound of the sirens calling out to him. Odysseus refuses to surrender his hope for the future by living for the moment, and he becomes the first sailor ever to hear the sirens without fatally crashing into the rocks surrounding the island where they all live. It's a great story about the power of hope. As Fleetwood Mac once put it, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Don't stop. It'll soon be here. There's power in thinking about life in terms of the long now. Living our lives with this ever-present awareness that right here, right now, in this moment, we're actually making history. Today, in some way, determines tomorrow. Most humans are experts at ignoring what might happen in the future. When we choose any action or decide on any path, we usually don't give much thought to the possible outcomes in the future or implications of that particular choice. But if we can't imagine the future, if we can't conceive of our lives as making some contribution to the future, we will live today without hope. Do you know what the fastest growing religion is today? It's actually not an organized religion. It has no hallowed places of worship, no sacred practices or texts, no ordained priests or prophets. The fastest growing religion today is nihilism. Nihilism is the, the belief that life is meaningless. And nihilism has no God but the God of the now. It has no belief but cynicism. It has no creed, but what's the point of any of this? But there are still some people in the world today who choose every day to believe that all of this is heading somewhere. They live hoping for and investing in a future they can't see. They live with the same vision we see in the life of the Apostle Paul, Not long after the death of Jesus, Paul has this life-changing, identity-altering experience. It's an experience that transformed him from a cruel persecutor of Christians into this passionate, unstoppable champion of Christianity. Paul was driven by a hope that all of this was heading somewhere, that there was a purpose to life. There was this divine power holding all of life together in love. Paul was so passionate about this hope that he couldn't not talk about it, couldn't keep quiet about it. And so he traveled around Asia Minor telling the story of Jesus and starting communities of Jesus' followers who are committed to living in this world with a strange hopefulness about the future with an odd belief that there's a purpose to life, that history is heading towards some fulfillment or consummation with God. 
This was a really bizarre concept for most people in Paul's day. Greeks and Romans didn't think of time as linear, that is, as heading from here to there. They believed that time was more like a wheel that just keeps on turning and turning, repeating itself without end. It's like that old Steve Miller band song, a time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. History, for the Greeks, history wasn't heading anywhere. Time, they said, just keeps repeating itself. So there's no purpose and no meaning to history. There's nothing new under the sun, as they once said. So live for today. Eat, drink, have a great time while you can. Because today is all you've got. But then Paul proposes this radical idea that there is this God who is calling and luring and beckoning time and everything within time towards some ultimate purpose. The redemption of creation, unity with God, the fulfillment of all that is and ever has been. It was a powerful, hopeful vision of the future. And Paul believed it with every fiber of his being. He modeled it in his own life and preaching. And we see that in today's reading from 1 Corinthians. Corinth was a challenging church. People were always fighting over something, and apparently some were fighting over who they liked best, Paul or Apollos. Apollos was a teacher. Paul was a church planter. And when Paul left Corinth to plant other churches, Apollos came in and did all the teaching. He was like a long-term sub for Paul. And it turns out some Corinthians liked Apollos a lot better than Paul. And so Paul writes to them and says, Neither I nor Apollos, our heroes, were just doing our part, just making our contribution, he says. He goes on like this. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants, the one who waters, they all have one purpose. Uh, we are God's co-workers. He says, working together, you are God's field. It's such a rare vision for how to do business how to live our lives. To actually say, I'm just the one who plants. Someone else is going to water. I, I have to leave it up to others and to God to make the growth happen. The truth is, Paul didn't know what would become of the Corinthians after he was gone. Would they survive? Would they grow? Would they remain true to the faith he planted in them? Paul just had this kind of hopefulness and faith in God's future. And that hopefulness and faith allowed him to do the work but not obsess over the long-term results. Paul could trust that over a long enough timeline, God's purposes would be fulfilled by those who came after him. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. We're just God's co-workers, he says, working together. You, you are God's field. What about you? Do you live with this kind of hope? Whether you're planting seeds or watering the seeds others have planted before you, it can be so hard to trust that the field will someday produce a harvest at a future date you can't yet see. The philosopher Immanuel Kant emphasized how important hope is to human action. The reason we do things or commit to someone, that's because we we hope that it will end well. Kant said, we can't rationally or logically prove hope. Instead, we can only go out, do our daily decisions and actions, believing, believing that there is some end point or outcome at the end of this. And so we have to hope that What we do will end well. And this end point might be unrealistic, even naive. 
But the point, according to Kant, is that we have to have hope in order to motivate human agency. And we know this. This is why we teach our kids to read. It's why we feed them and carpool them all over town in rush hour traffic five nights a week. It's why we sacrifice for them and sometimes even toss and turn all night worrying about them. We do it because we have some hope that their lives have a meaningful purpose, a promising future. Some who know St. Andrew well know about a woman named Rachel Lowe. Rachel Lowe started St. Andrew about 62 years ago. In 1960, Rachel Lowe walked the neighborhoods of Littleton, just going house to house, knocking on doors, asking people if they'd be interested in starting a Methodist church. And by September of that year, a handful of people gathered at the Peabody School for a little worship service. Two months later, the church was chartered with 24 families and an annual budget of $1,000. They named the church St. Andrew because Andrew was the disciple who introduced others, including Peter, to Jesus. And Rachel Lowe planted this hope in that little church. And that hope remains central to the DNA of St. Andrew 62 years later. What was that hope? What is that hope? That hope is, as she said, to do more for others than for ourselves. Rachel Lowe, like Paul, had a long now mindset. Believing in a future she couldn't see or improve, she made choices and took actions that made the future of this church possible. And where would we be right now if Rachel Lowe hadn't knocked on doors 62 years ago? What about you? Are you living your life today, giving, sharing, planting, watering, with that confident hope that because of you, because of you, the powerful story of God's love and grace will endure long after you are gone. That hope is more urgent and needed today than ever before in this world. I recently came across some startling statistics. Over the last 60 years, belief in God has been consistently trending downward in the U.S. Just 81%, about four out of five Americans today, say they believe in God. And this is down 6% just over the last five years. It's down 11% over the last 10 years. It's down 17% over the last six decades. This decline in belief, according to the statistics, is driven primarily by young adults. Today, only 68% of young adults report belief in God. By 2070, it is projected that fewer than 50% of all Americans will identify as Christian. Now, some experts want to put the blame on young adults for this decline in belief. They'll claim that those young adults, they just embraced relativism or humanism. They're just apathetic or spiritually lost, but it would be a tragic and fatal mistake for the church to blame young adults for the decline in faith in America. Because young adults are not the problem. The problem is the church. And a growing number of young adults are simply exposing it. They're not rejecting God. They're simply rejecting the God that too many churches have manufactured. A God who was judgmental and homophobic and anti-science and supernatural and distant and uninvolved and silent in the face of injustice and obsessed with sexual morality and confined exclusively to the pages of some ancient book. The hope that inspires and fuels our ministry here at St. Andrew is that they might encounter a different God, the God we worship every Sunday, 
A God who is generous to all and condemning of no one. A God who is inclusive of everyone and present in every expression of loving relationship. A God who is deeply concerned for the poor and the marginalized and the oppressed and the earth. A God who is obsessed with one thing, and that is our well-being and that of our souls and our bodies. A God who is too big to be confined to our Bibles and way too powerful to be imprisoned by dogmas and way, way too busy offering us a hopeful future to ever, ever destine us to a meaningless past. This is what makes St. Andrew one of the rarest of all fields. You look around this church and you can see how it's all leading to some good and holy purpose and some future that together we can glimpse in hope, but none of us can fully see. But if you could peer far into that future and see how all of this turned out, how your own personal contribution here made some difference in someone's life, in this community, in this world, would it impact the choices you make and the actions you take and how you live your life and how you give and the things to which you give today? Paul says we're just planting and watering, building for a better tomorrow. God does the growing. Our takeaways for today, people of faith adopt a long now mindset. Every day, make choices and take actions that make God's future possible. And remember, some of us plant, others water, but God gives the growth. We come with beautiful secrets, we come with purposes written on our hearts, written on our souls. I want to add to
And I'm Pam Musgrave. We're here to talk to you today about the stewardship campaign. John Wesley said, do all the good that you can. When thinking about our obligation to financially support this church, we should consider what might have happened if generations before ours did not support and grow our community. Would this church have been able to feed the hungry, provide housing, reach out to isolated parts of our society? and provide a place for us to nurture and sustain ourselves and our families and our faith. That is so important. One of the reasons that we love this church is because of its strong emphasis for outreach services. I've seen the impact that we have on people when I volunteer my time and resources supporting the food market at East Elementary. That's a great program. We have an obligation to future generations to make sure this church continues to be sustained into the future. Your stewardship pledge is an opportunity for each of our families to leave our faith community better equipped to meet those challenges going forward. Hopefully, without a capital campaign this year, you'll have more opportunities to support the ongoing operations of this church. Our ties and stewardship pledges are our opportunity to give back to the church so that our legacy of services can continue on. Please join Pam and I, and let's answer Wesley's call to do as much good as we can. Thank, Thank you. you. And now, as you return to the rhythms and routines of your busy lives this week, I leave you with this benediction from BrucePruer.com. There is a world out there that is oversupplied with theories and technology, but drastically undersupplied with hope. You, however, like Christ, are tomorrow's people. Those who know the future is pregnant with promise and hope. This same Jesus comes again with glory to judge the living and the dead. Go and live out your hope graciously and courageously. This same Jesus comes again with glory to judge the living and the dead. The grace of Christ Jesus, who is the same today, yesterday, and forever, will lead you to the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and then take you on to those tasks and joys which will prepare you for the greater glory which is to come. Amen. <laughs>